Let's turn together in our Bibles to Jeremiah 40 tonight. Jeremiah 40, where God's Word reads as follows. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had let him go from Ramah, when he took him bound in chains along with all the captives of Jerusalem and Judah, who were being exiled to Babylon. The captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God pronounced this disaster against this place. The Lord has brought it about, and he has done as he said. Because you sinned against the Lord and did not obey his voice, this thing has come upon you. Now behold, I release you today from the chains on your hands. If it seems good to you to come with me to Babylon, come, and I will look after you well. But if it seems wrong to you to come with me to Babylon, do not come. See, the whole land is before you. Go wherever you think it good and right to go. If you remain, then return to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon appointed governor of the cities of Judah and dwell with him among the people. Or go wherever you think it right to go. So the captain of the guard gave him an allowance of food and a present and let him go. Then Jeremiah went to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam at Mizpah, and lived with him among the people who were left in the land. When all the captains of the forces in the open country and their men heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, governor in the land, and had committed to him men, women, and children, those of the poorest of the land who had not been taken into exile to Babylon, they went to Gedaliah at Mizpah. Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, Johanan, the son of Korea, Saraiah, the son of Tanhumeth, the sons of Ephi, the Netophathite, Jezaniah, the son of Maacathite, they and their men. Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, swore to them and their men, saying, Do not be afraid to serve the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. As for me, I will dwell at Mizpah to represent you before the Chaldeans who will come to us. But as for you, gather wine and summer fruits and oil and store them in your vessels and dwell in your cities that you have taken. Likewise, when all the Judeans who were in Moab and among the Ammonites and in Edom and in other lands heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant in Judah and had appointed Gedaliah the son of Ahikam the son of Shaphan as governor over them, then all the Judeans returned from the, from the places to which they had been driven and came to the land of Judah to Gedaliah at Mizpah. And they gathered wine and summer fruits in great abundance." Now Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the leaders of the forces in the open country came to Gedaliah at Mizpah and said to him, do you, do you know that Balas, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to take your life? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, would not believe them. Then Johanan, the son of Korea, spoke secretly to Gedaliah at Mizpah, Please let me go and strike down Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and no one will know it. Why should he take your life so that all the Judeans who are gathered about you would be scattered and the remnant of Judah would perish? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, said to Jonathan, Johanan, the son of Korea, you shall not do this thing, for you are speaking falsely of Ishmael. So far the reading from God's word this evening. May he add its blessing to our hearts. There are times when we are confused by the consequences of sin. Maybe you've sinned against somebody, you've recognized it, you've sought their forgiveness, but there are continued consequences in your life as a result of your sin. And you might say to yourself, well, that's not fair. I asked for forgiveness. But forgiveness, of course, isn't necessarily a guarantee that consequences for sin will be removed. For example, in the Old Testament, Achan at Ai admits that he took uh, the, the things devoted to the Lord. He, he, he had hid them in his tent, and he confessed that, and, and he confessed that before the Lord, and yet still he, was, he and his whole family were stoned for his transgression against the Lord. And this chapter is teaching that same kind of truth, that there are consequences that remain for sin. In light of the exile that we read about in chapter 39, we see certainly an evidence of God's grace in this chapter, but we do see the remaining uh, manifestations of consequences for sin in this chapter as well. And so what we want to learn from this chapter tonight is that in the midst of the grace and mercy of forgiveness, sin and its consequences continue to abound or continue to be 
manifest. And so we're going to look at three things to learn that lesson. We're first going to look at God's grace and mercy in verses 1 through 6. Then we're going to look at the consequence for sin in verses 7 through 12. And then we're going to look at the consequence of the fall in verses 13 through 16. So we want to learn tonight that in the midst of the grace and mercy of forgiveness, sin and its consequences continue to abound, to abound or continue to be manifest. And we're going to look at God's grace and mercy, the consequence for sin, and the consequence of the fall. So let's begin by looking at God's grace and mercy. Of course, we always uh, remember the context of chapter 40, uh, immediately preceding chapter 40 is chapter 39, and the account of the fall of Jerusalem and the fulfillment of the warnings that Jeremiah has been speaking against the people of Jerusalem for generations now. Uh, Jeremiah wasn't even the only prophet who shared these judgments of God, these threatenings from God when it came to the exile. And, and other prophets and Jeremiah have spoken in, in great, uh, with, uh, with a great number of prophecies and, and the people have rejected them. They have continued in their idolatry. They have continued to serve false gods. And from a place like 1 Kings 8, we can, which is uh, Solomon's prayer of dedication of the temple, in 1 Kings 8 you see that captivity and exile is a consequence of sin, a, a consequence of uh, 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 the anger of God manifest against the hardened heart of Israel. And the sin of Judah, their idolatry, uh, it leads God to cast them from his presence. They've been sent away from the temple. The temple, of course, was the symbol of the very presence of God among his people where he descended in a cloud and, and settled on the temple when it, was first, uh, when it was first dedicated to the Lord. But we also saw in last chapter, we saw the judgment of God in the exile, but we also saw God's vindication of Jeremiah and Eben Melech uh, last time. We saw that Jeremiah's words, his prophecies were proved true, which, which vindicated him in the eyes of all the doubters that lived around him. His loyalty to Israel was confirmed because he stayed among his people. And then we saw in chapter 39, verse 12, that Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, in fact, was commanded to give Jeremiah special treatment, uh, a special care to take care of him, to, to, to watch over him, unlike the other exiles. And, and the interaction between Jeremiah and Nebuzaradan is described in more detail in this chapter. Uh, and we saw this interaction between Nebuzaradan and, and Jeremiah. He gives him a choice. He, he tells him, you can either come to, uh, to Babylon with me and I'll take care of you there, or you can go to Gedaliah in Mizpah and, and I'll take care of you there, or you can go anywhere you want. And, and, and so Jeremiah was sent away with, a, with a, an allowance of regular provisions and, and with a special gift which is not described for us. So uh, he gives him these provisions and, and sends him on his way. And, and in that first opening section, there's some interesting things that I want to notice. Interesting to notice, first of all, is that Jeremiah is initially carried away with the other exiles. In, in verse 1, we see Jeremiah in chains, carried off with the other exiles, and he arrives in a place called Ramah. Now, there are two options as to where Ramah could be. Ramah could be about five miles north of Jerusalem, or it could be in the northern part of Galilee, what would, would later become Galilee. But wherever the city was... It was the staging point, it seems. It seems to be the place where the people, the armies of Babylon took all their plunder and from there made the trek across the wilderness to their own home empire, so, so to speak. And so at that staging point, Jeremiah is released. Jeremiah is giving his freedom before the rest of the people are carried across into Babylon. And that's where he is set free. And the second thing that's fairly interesting, I think when we walk through this chapter, is how educated Nebuzaradan was about the consequence that Judah was suffering. He knew that Judah was suffering for their disobedience. He knew that their exile was brought upon them by the Lord himself because of their failure to heed the warnings of the prophets. And, and we see that in verse 2, that Nebuzaradan has a recognition that God has decreed this disaster. And in verse 3, we see this recognition that it's because Israel failed to heed God's warnings. And so he, he proceeds to free God's prophet and, and give him that choice of where he's going 
to live. And, and that's God's mercy. That's God's mercy to Jeremiah to free him from the bondage of exile. And then the third thing that's fairly interesting about uh, this opening section that we're looking at here is the treatment of Gedaliah and the people themselves. Now, Gedaliah, he is often mentioned with his lineage. Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan. Uh, he's mentioned 22 times, this Gedaliah. He's mentioned 22 times in the prophecy of Jeremiah, and 15 of those times, his whole lineage is attached to his name. Now, that seems a bit odd, because in the other characters of Scripture, when we meet David, we meet David as the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, but he doesn't continually get identified with David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed. But, uh, but Gedaliah does. And it seems most likely that he is being distinguished in this way because we met a different Gedaliah in chapter 38. And the Gedaliah in chapter 38 was the son of Pasher, and he was the one who accused Jeremiah before King Zedekiah. He was the one who pled with King Zedekiah that Jeremiah would be killed. And so it seems likely that the reason that Gedaliah's lineage is tacked on is that we can distinguish between the two people, that we can know this is not the one who was the accuser of Jeremiah, but this is the one who by God's hand was appointed to be his protector. He was, he was appointed by the Babylonian king as to be the governor of the remnant, and he lives in Mizpah. He doesn't live in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is burned and tore down and is in total chaos. He lived six miles north of Jerusalem in a in a city called Mizpah. And that's God's mercy on, on the people as well. God's mercy on Jeremiah and the people that there would be a remnant that could gather under the leadership of a, of a Hebrew ruler to remain in the land, to keep their feet in the promised land, so to speak. But all these interesting things that we've noted, they're not the purpose of this chapter. These things are, aren't some interesting side story. See, all these interesting things that we note of the grace and mercy to Jeremiah or the grace and mercy of God to the people of Israel, they're a manifestation of God's patience. They're a manifestation of God's long-suffering. Why should he not wipe them from the earth for all their rebellion, for all their idolatry, for all their sin? Why, why should God not utterly destroy them by the hand of, of Babylon? What have they deserved but judgment and destruction? Uh, in Eden, the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, there was a message that God attached to that sin. He said, the day you eat of this tree, you will surely die. Well, why is it not different for Judah and for Israel in this context? Why does he do not just wipe them out? Isn't that true in this circumstance as well, that, that disobedience and rebellion and sin would lead to death? But what the scriptures repeatedly show us about God Almighty is that he's patient in the midst of human disobedience. You can see that in a place like Exodus uh, 34 and verse 6 and 7. Exodus 34 is right after the uh, in incident with the golden calf and, and Moses has, has thrown down the first stone tables and and God calls him back to the mountain with a new set of stone tables to give him the Ten Commandments again. And when he's on the mountain, Moses asked God if he could see him, if he could, if he could lay his eyes on the glory of God. And, and God, of course, doesn't allow him to see his face, but he, but he passes by and allows him to see uh, the back of him. And as the Lord passed before him, he proclaims himself. And this is what the Lord says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So you see this picture of God, even after the grotesque idolatry of the golden calf, uh, after Moses went down the mountain, even in that context, he declares himself a God who is slow to anger, who is abounding in steadfast love, a God that we so desperately need, don't we? Because we sin against Him and we transgress against Him and, and we need His mercy from day to day. In, uh, in some sense, it connects uh, to what we were talking about this morning in that, that, that desire, that compassion that God has for the world. And so in 2 Peter 3, it's another place where we see something of the, of the compassion of 
of, of God, how he, is, um, how he is patient with his people. And it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And so we can see, in a sense, this display of God's mercy, this display of God's long-suffering here on this, uh, in this chapter. Even in the shadow that we see in the exile of Israel, the shadow of the final day of the Lord, this, this miniature replication of God's final judgment in, in the exile of Israel. Even in that dark, dark day, we see God's grace and mercy on, on display. It's the central theme of the covenant of grace, isn't it? The obligation that God still asks of us, perfect obedience, we cannot meet it. God is patient with us and he sends his son into the world as a, as a mediator, as one who would be our substitute. And so where there should be death and punishment, God provides grace and kindness and forgiveness and, and new life. And, and that's what we see in the first verses of this chapter in verses 1 through 6. But then as we work our way through verses 7 through 12, we do see that there is a consequence for sin. Certainly we see the grace and mercy of God on display toward Israel, but the consequence of sin is not removed. God's mercy is great, but the exile isn't removed. When Jeremiah is set free, he's not returned to a rebuilt Jerusalem where the temple is intact and the glory of God is, has filled that temple again. No, he, he is not able to do those things because the consequences of sin remain in place. The city of Jerusalem lies in ruin. The, the damage of the flames that the Babylonians set in that city by God's agents of judgment, they, they remain in that city. And so their consequences for sin are still around them. The Israelites who had, who had fled to the surrounding nations before the exile, they, they return, they, they come back to Gedaliah, all these military leaders, and, and the governor, uh, Gedaliah the governor, he's appointed by Babylon, and, and his word to them is to live under the yoke of Babylon, not to pretend like the consequence is gone. The king of Babylon is ruling over Israel at this point, and the governor encourages them to live under that yoke and, and promises them that if they serve the king, it will be well with them. So the glory of Israel is not restored. The son of David is still removed from the, the throne and Jerusalem's walls are, are still lying in heaps on the ground. There certainly is mercy regarding condemnation, but just because God shows mercy towards condemnation doesn't mean that all the consequences are removed. God is using the exile to bring the people to repentance and sorrow over their sin. And you can see that in a place like Psalm 37. It's one of the post-exilic psalms that are, that are written. And there it says in the first verse, By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. See, there was a, a conviction uh, through the remaining consequences of sin, God was pressing on his people the great, the great punishment that they were enduring. He is essentially, by keeping the consequences in place, saying to his people, look at the cost of sin. Now, I know that all of us have experienced something like this. When you sin, there are consequences that remain. When you do wrong, though God might forgive you if you turn to him in true repentance, the consequences for your sin do not necessarily get removed. So that's certainly true for major scandalous sins. So, for example, if, if I got it into my head that I was going to go out and steal a car tonight, I could go steal a car and I might sincerely repent of that sin and be forgiven by the Lord God Almighty. But when the blue flashing lights showed up on my driveway, I'd be going to jail because the consequence for my sin was not removed, even though, uh, even though the judgment for my sin was removed by Christ. But it also shows up in our smaller sins. If, if you lie, if you, if, you, if you lie to people and, and you're found out in that lie, your, your trust is broken with people and, it, and people become more cautious about the, the things that you say to them. Or if you are unkind, habitually unkind to people, they will not want to be around you anymore. Those are all 
consequences of your sin. Your sin might be forgiven, but the consequences still remain. So God never promises to remove consequences from us if, if we sin. His mercy is not to remove the pain of sin, but His mercy is to remove the guilt of sin. And so God leaves the pain of sin in place, and He does that for several reasons. The first reason why God might leave the consequence for sin in place is to keep us from future sin. If we would be able to sin with impunity, if there was no pain as a result of our sin, there would be less reason to curtail our behavior. There would be less reason for us to, to think twice the next time this sin comes along. You see, the pain of sin is actually a mercy from God. Because in the pain of sin, we see His restraining hand. And it's also present even in the life of the unbeliever. When we think of God's law, God's law has three uses. The first one is to help us to see that we need Christ. And the third one is to guide us in our walk of thankfulness before God as a result of our salvation. The second one is to restrain sin in the world. That the world would have God's law in place that would serve as a boundary, a barrier to restrain sin. And so the civil magistrate's job is to use God's law as a, to restrain sin in society. The magistrate, when he gives a consequence, he is assigning a value to a sin. That's what he's doing. So again, going back to my foolish notion of stealing a car, the civil magistrate says, if you steal a car, uh, you will spend this much time in, uh, in, 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 in prison. And that's assigning a value of a sin uh, and, and, and assigning pain for an action based on its immorality. And so when in our culture we have a consequence from the judge that's to serve not only to keep us from doing that action again, but also to help other people who are around to see the pain of sin and say, we will not do that sin ourselves. And so God shows pain, leaves pain in place for sin to serve as a deterrent, to keep us from future sin. Pain of sin keeps us from sinning because we remember. We remember what that sin did in our lives. So sin, God leaves it in place mercifully to keep us from future sin. But we also see the pain of sin remaining to help us to see the ugliness of sin. The pain keeps us from trying it again, to be sure, but it also shows us the ugliness of sin. The, the destruction of sin cannot be mistaken. For Israel and their idolatry and all the things that were wrapped up in their idolatry, their, 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 their desecration of the Sabbath, their, their dishonoring of authority, their, their murdering of their children and of each other, the adultery, their stealing, uh, their, their bearing false witness, all those things wrapped up in their idolatry, it led to their exile. And so it caused Israel to see, my sin leads to nothing good. There's no mistaking that the pain that God leaves in place because of sin helps us to see sin only has bad fruit. The, the same is true for sin in our lives. Sin's fruit is, is never positive. It, it might seem so in the short term. It might seem so as we cover up our sin with another sin and, and we go down that road. But, but the consequences of sin are, are never positive. Ultimately, we'll always come face to face with grief and sorrow and misery and pain because of sin. And so the consequence of, of sin is, is ugly. It's, it's miserable and its pleasures are, are fleeting at, at best. And so God is merciful to keep the pain of sin before us because it helps us to see that sin is vile and odious and ugly. The third reason why God might mercifully keep sin in our lives and the pain of it is that it serves as a reminder to us that we need a Savior. For Jerusalem, there certainly was a reminder that they needed to be delivered from the Babylonians. For them, it was a much more physical thing. For us, it's a, a shadow that, that points us forward. But for, for Israel, being deported to Babylon, a forced deportation to, to Babylon, the, the realization of the 
Israelite was, we need a deliverer. We need deliverance from this mighty force that has conquered us. Now, for the Christian, we uh, need a deliverer from a different enemy. We need a deliverer from the world, the flesh, and the devil. We need a deliverer from ourselves. Would you look for Christ apart from the destructive nature of sin? If sin was just, was just to be enjoyed and there was no pain in it, would you turn to Christ and, and flee to Him? Would you, would you seek refuge in Him? Would you be desperate for His love to cover you? The pain of the actions of sin are a mercy. Have you felt this destruction? Have you felt the loneliness of the secrecy of sin? Have you felt the mess of the fruit of sin? There's only one one solution for you, brother and sister. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only solution for this problem in your life. Uh, think about Jesus in, in Matthew 11, in verse 28 and, and 30. He, he talks to us about, he talks to the people who are living under the consequences of sin and under the pain of sin and under the misery of sin. And he says there, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light so what does Jesus say there Jesus says there when you are alone you come to me come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and he says to you, when you feel that emotional drain and that pain of sin, he says, come to me because I know that you're laboring and I know that you're heavy laden. And when the pain of sin overwhelms you and it feels like it's crushing you, Jesus says, come to me because I will give you rest. The pain of sin remains so that you can see that you need Christ to hold you up. Nothing pushes you towards Christ more than an understanding of who you are. Nothing points you to Christ more than an understanding of what you have done and the consequences of your sin. So we've seen God's grace and mercy, and we've seen the consequence of sin, and now we want to look at the consequence of the fall. Because we see certainly God's mercy on display and we see certainly the after effects of the sin of Israel on display in terms of the exile not being taken away. But there is also a consequence of the fall that can be seen in this chapter in verses 13 through 16. In the, in the midst of God's mercy to Jeremiah and the people, there's also that reminder that sin is still lurking. It's like this chapter makes you think that Israel hasn't learned a thing yet. They haven't learned a thing after the exile by the Assyrians in 720, now the exile by the Babylonians in, in 586, the, the complete ravaging of the, the nation of Israel so that they're only the poorest and weakest left in the land. Everybody else is scattered to the wind. And in the middle of that, right after that second exile has happened, the, the people still staggering under the burden of the remaining consequence of sin. And the first thing we read about is a murderous plot from one soldier to the governor. Uh, Ishmael, he, he has a reported plot against Gedaliah. Now, that in itself is a problem, but then the response of those who are loyal to Gedaliah is just as much a problem. They ask for, for Gedaliah's permission to kill Ishmael, and when Ishmael says no, they say, come on, let's just do it secretly. Nobody needs to know about it. We'll, we'll kill him and, and nobody will, will know about it. You see, their intention may be good, but their methodology is completely sinful. It would have been right to investigate, to find out the truth. It would have been, been right to confront Ishmael with his sinful plot, but their methodology is to simply go and, and kill. And Gedaliah in this moment is naive. He's insistent on, on Ishmael's innocence. And as we'll see the next time we're in Jeremiah together, it's going to cost Gedaliah his life. You see, the picture of Israel is far from idyllic, isn't it? I mean, not only the sin and, and all that mess that's going on, but they seem so hard-hearted and so hard-headed. They, they don't seem to learn 
They don't seem to learn anything. They are a people punished for sin while still sinning. That's who Israel is. They are a people being punished for their sin while they continue in sin. But that's the circumstance for the church as well, isn't it? Isn't that what we're like? If you are in Christ, you know your sin, and you flee to Christ, and you are forgiven by Christ, and still you cry, O wretched man that I am. That is the Christian life. Because you do the things you don't want to do, and you don't do the things that you want to do. And so Paul's assessment in, in Romans 7 is, Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Aren't we in the same place? People who are punished for their sin continue in sin. It's the struggle of the Christian life. So as we see God's grace and mercy, as we see the consequence for sin, and, and as we see the consequence of the fall, there are two lessons that I want us to learn as a congregation tonight. And the first one is that we should take time to meditate on the bad fruit of sin. We're to meditate on the bad fruit of sin. This is to keep you from thinking that your sin is okay. Now, let me be clear. I'm not asking you to meditate on anybody else's sin. I only want you to meditate on your own sin. We're all very good at meditating on other people's sin. We're going to leave that aside for now. We want to meditate on our sin. We need to come face to face with our sin. We must remember Christ in our sin and see our desperate need of Him. We have to keep ourselves from longing for sin. We have to keep ourselves from future sin. And we have to look for deliverance from our sin. And that means you can't spend your life breezing by your sin as if it doesn't matter. You can't spend your life acting as if your sin is so inconsequential, but everybody else's sin is the end of the world. Take advantage of God's grace and mercy in your life. Think about the sin, the pain that your sin has cost to yourself and to others. Reflect on the continuing consequences of sin on your life. Let it be something that frightens you, that terrifies you. Maybe, maybe your sin has caused your marriage to suffer. Or maybe your sin has damaged your relationship with your children. Or maybe your relationship with your parents is damaged because of your sin. Or maybe your soul is dried up and shriveling because you're quenching the Holy Spirit with your continuing, continual pursuit of, of sin. Think of your sin, that by God's grace, the pain of that sin would be an agent to turn you from it, to turn you from it that you would flee to Christ. You know, God in His Word, He promises that when temptation to sin comes, that there is always an escape. He always provides an escape for us. And in uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and, and verse 13, he, he gives us this very reassuring promise. God does not put us in a place where we cannot resist the sin uh, that he sets before us to test us. Uh, in uh, verse 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. So you're not unique. You're not unique. The sins that you're facing, they're common to man. You're not the only one who has ever endured this temptation. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will always provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now, if you're like me, sometimes you need a lot of pain before you start looking around for that exit. Sometimes you need a lot of agony in your life before you say, Something's not right in this action. I need to go this way. This way of escape that God Almighty has provided for you. So meditate on the bad fruit of your sin so that you would see that. So that you would be prompted to look for that way of escape. And the second thing that I want us to learn uh, as we consider the sin, the remaining consequences of sin that we see in this chapter, is that we should see God's mercy over our sins. If you have a healthy response to sin, 
You must not only think about the pain of your sin, but you must also think of the solution for your sin. When, when you come face to face with your sin, if all you do is go inside and say, I'm a terrible person, you haven't gone far enough. Because when you see your sin, it should cause you to say, yes, I'm a terrible person. But it should also cause you to look to Christ, who is the perfect, blessed Redeemer, the one who rescues you from your sin. You have to remember Christ if you're going to deal with your sin in a healthy way. And I'm here to proclaim to you tonight that there is no sin so great that the mercy of Christ will not cover it. There is nothing that you can do in this life where God will say to you, no, I won't forgive you for it. The only thing that you will not be forgiven for is continued rebellion <coughs> till the day of your death. And to press this home on us, I want to review Israel's sins. I want to think about what Israel did. And God sent them away, but he promised to bring them back, didn't he? Now, what is the record of Israel's sin? Well, Jeremiah has confronted them, and, and we've reviewed it already earlier on in, in this sermon, but the, the idolatry and the murder and the adultery and the Sabbath-breaking and the lying and the stealing and, and all those other sin, sins that are recorded in this, in this book. It's not a list for the faint of heart. If that was your neighbor, you would not think that that person was a good person. You would not send your friends to go play with your neighbor kids if that's what your neighbor was doing. But God promises to bring them back. He doesn't cast them out forever. God brings them back. He's, and that's not, to in, that's not intended to minimize our view of sin. It's not to teach us that sin doesn't matter so much, but it's to teach us how great the mercy and forgiveness of God is. It's not to minimize your view of sin, but to maximize your view of of God's grace and mercy. And so the promise of Scripture is clear. In, in Romans 10 and in verse 9, there the Apostle Paul writes, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And in 1 John 1 verse 9, the, the Apostle John writes, If you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, the promises of God, they're, they're not offered to you only on the condition that you have not committed some of these big sins. That's not the offer of the gospel. The offer of the gospel is to believe, is to flee to Christ, is to find redemption in Him. But there is a, an addendum to that offer of the gospel. Christ came to deliver from sin and that's not just a future thing. When Christ comes and he changes your heart, your heart is changed. Scripture says in 1 John 3, verse 6, that no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. And so there is hope for the sinner who flees to Christ. Fleeing to Christ offers forgiveness, but fleeing to Christ means leaving behind the life of sin. It doesn't mean that you won't struggle with sin. It, won't, it doesn't mean that you won't even fall into sin or into grievous sin even. But the gospel does promise that when you sin, you will not dwell in it. That when, you're si when you sin, your heart will not be comforted by it. Jesus came to take away your sin. You cannot dwell in it anymore if Christ is your Savior. So the judgment of God over Jerusalem, it's, it's given for our clarity. What is your sin that would lead God to cast you out today? What is your sin that would lead God to send you into exile? What is your offense against Him that needs His forgiveness? He's ready to forgive you. He's ready to forgive you today. You just have to lay it before him. You have to confess it. You have to repent of it. You have to turn from it. But you must turn. You must turn from your sin to him. You must confess him as your Lord. You must embrace his gift, this gift of taking away the guilt of your sin.
And if that profession is sincere, and if that profession is worked in you by the Holy Spirit deep within your heart, you must wait for him. You must wait for him in the midst of the struggles of sin. You must learn to trust Him that He will raise you up on the last day. But you know how you will be raised up? This is spectacular. When you look down, that spotted garment that you wore your whole life will be gone. It's going to be gone forever. And all that you will have left is pure white garments. And who will have given it to you? You won't have given it to you. Christ will have given it to you. He is your Savior, and He loves you, and He doesn't want you to dwell in sin. The pain that you see in this life is not the cause of God. The pain that you see in this life is the consequence of sin. Will you see it as that? Will you see it as the thing that pushes you to your Savior? Will you see it as the thing that gives you hope? that one day, one day, that pain of sin will be removed. Let's pray together.